A Dream of Red Hands by Bram Stoker Performed by Otis Gyrie The first opinion given to me regarding Jacob Settle was a simple, descriptive statement. He's a down-in-the-mouth chap. But I found that it embodied the thoughts and ideas of all his fellow workmen. There was, in the phrase, a certain easy tolerance, an absence of positive feeling of any kind, rather than any complete opinion, which marked pretty accurately the man's place in public esteem. Still, there was some dissimilarity between this and his appearance, which unconsciously set me thinking, and by degrees, as I saw more of the place and the workmen, I came to have a special interest in him. He was, I found, forever doing kindnesses, not involving money expenses beyond his humble means, but in the manifold ways of forethought and forbearance, and self-repression which are of the truer charities of life. Women and children trusted him implicitly, though, strangely enough, he rather shunned them, except when anyone was sick, and then he made his appearance to help if he could, timidly and awkwardly. He led a very solitary life, keeping house by himself in a tiny cottage, or rather hut, of one room, far on the edge of the moorland. His existence seemed so sad and solitary that I wished to cheer it up, and for the purpose took the occasion, when we had both been sitting up with a child, injured by me through accident, to offer to lend him books. He gladly accepted. And as we parted in the gray of the dawn, I felt that something of mutual confidence had been established between us. The books were always most carefully and punctually returned, and in time Jacob Settle and I became quite friends. Once or twice, as I crossed the moorland on Sundays, I looked in on him, but on such occasions he was shy and ill at ease, so that I felt diffident about calling to see him. He would never, under any circumstances, come into my own lodgings. One Sunday afternoon, I was coming back from a long walk beyond the moor, and as I passed Settle's cottage, stopped at the door to say, how do you do, to him. As the door was shut, I thought that he was out, and merely knocked for form's sake, or through habit, not expecting to get any answer. To my surprise, I heard a feeble voice from within, though what was said I could not hear. I entered at once and found Jacob lying, half-dressed upon his bed. He was as pale as death, and the sweat was simply rolling off his face. His hands were unconsciously gripping the bedclothes, as a drowning man holds on to whatever he may grasp. As I came in, he half arose, with a wild, hunted look in his eyes, which were wide open and staring, as though something of horror had come before him. But when he recognized me, he sank back on the couch with a smothered sob of relief and closed his eyes. I stood by him for a while, quite a minute or two, while he gasped. Then he opened his eyes and looked at me but with such a despairing, woeful expression that, as I am a living man, I would have rather seen that frozen look of horror. I sat down beside him and asked him about his health. For a while he would not answer me except to say that he was not ill, but then, after scrutinizing me closely, he half arose on his elbow and said, I thank you kindly, sir but I'm simply telling you the truth. I am not ill, as men call it, though God knows where there be not worse sicknesses than doctors know of. I'll tell you, as you are so kind, but I trust that you won't even mention such a thing to a living soul, for it might work me more and greater woe. I'm suffering from a bad dream. A bad dream, I said hoping to cheer him, but dreams pass away with the light, even with waking. 
There I stopped, for before he spoke, I saw the answer in his desolate look round the little place. No, no, that's all well for people that live in comfort, and with those they love around them. It is a thousand times worse for those who live alone and have to do so. What cheer is there for me waking here in the silence of the night with the wide moor around me full of voices and full of faces that make my waking a worse dream than my sleep? Oh, young sir, you have no past that can send its legions to people the darkness and the empty space, and I pray the good God that you may never have. As he spoke, there was such an almost irresistible gravity of conviction in his manner that I abandoned my remonstrance about his solitary life. I felt that I was in the presence of some secret influence which I could not fathom. To my relief, for I knew not what to say, he went on. Two nights past I have dreamt it. It was hard enough the first night, but I came through it. Last night the exception and expectation was in itself almost worse than the dream, until the dream came and then it swept away every remembrance of lesser pain. I stayed awake till just before the dawn, and then it came again. And ever since I have been in such an agony as I am sure the dying feel, and with it all the dread of tonight. Before he had got to the end of the sentence, my mind was made up, and I felt that I could speak to him more cheerfully. Try to get some sleep, early tonight, in fact, before the evening has passed away. The sleep will refresh you, and I promise you there will not be any bad dreams after tonight. He shook his head hopelessly, so I sat a little longer and then left him. When I got home, I made my arrangements for the night, for I had made up my mind to share Jacob Settle's lonely vigil in his cottage on the moor. I judged that if he got to sleep before sunset, he would wake well before midnight, and so, just as the bells of the city were striking eleven, I stood opposite his door armed with a bag, in which were my supper and extra-large flask, a couple of candles and a book. The moonlight was bright and flooded the whole moor, till it was almost as light as day, but ever and anon black clouds drove across the sky and made a darkness which by comparison seemed almost tangible. I opened the door softly and entered without waking Jacob, who lay asleep with his white face upward. He was still, and again bathed it sweat. I tried to imagine what visions were passing before those closed eyes which could bring with them the misery and woe which were stamped on the face. But fancy failed me, and I waited for the awakening. It came suddenly, and in a fashion which touched me to the quick, for the hollow groan that broke from the man's white lips as he half arose and sank back was manifestly the realization or completion of some train of thought which had gone before. If this be dreaming, said I to myself, then it must be based on some very terrible reality. What can have been that unhappy fact that he spoke of? While I thus spoke, he realized that I was with him. It struck me as strange that he had no period of that doubt as to whether dream or reality surrounded him which commonly marks an unexpected environment of waking men. With a positive cry of joy, he seized my hand and held it in his two wet, trembling hands, as a frightened child clings on to someone whom it loves. I tried to soothe him. There, there, it's all right. I have come to stay with you tonight, and together we will try to fight this evil dream. He let my hand go suddenly and sank back on his bed and covered his eyes with his hands. Fight it? The evil dream? Oh, no, sir, no. No mortal power can fight that dream, 
for it comes from God and is burned in here. And he beat upon his forehead. Then he went on. It is the same dream, ever the same. And yet it grows in its power to torture me every time it comes. What is the dream, I asked, thinking that the speaking of it might give him some relief. But he shrank away from me, and after a long pause, said, No, I had better not tell it. It may not come again. There was, manifestly, something to conceal from me, something that lay behind the dream, so I answered, All right. I hope you have seen the last of it, but if it should come again, you will tell me, will you not? I ask not of curiosity, but because I think it may relieve you to speak. He answered with what I thought was almost an undue amount of solemnity. If it comes again, I shall tell you all. Then I tried to get his mind away from the subject to more mundane things. So I produced supper and made him share it with me, including the contents of the flask. After a little, he braced up, and when I lit my cigar, having given him another, we smoked a full hour and talked of many things. Little by little, the comfort of his body stole over his mind, and I could see sleep laying her gentle hands on his eyelids. He felt it, too, and told me that now he felt all right, and I might safely leave him. But I told him that, right or wrong, I was going to see in the daylight. So I lit my other candle and began to read as he fell asleep. By degrees, I got interested in my book, so interested that presently I was startled by its dropping out of my hands. I looked and saw that Jacob was still asleep, and I rejoiced to see that there was on his face a look of unwanted happiness, while his lips seemed to move with unspoken words. Then I turned to my work again, and again woke, but this time to feel chilled to my very marrow by hearing the voice from the bed beside me. Not with those red hands! Never! Never! On looking at him, I found that he was still asleep. He woke, however, in an instant, and did not seem surprised to see me. There was again that strange apathy as to his surroundings. Then I said, Settle, tell me your dream. You may speak freely, for I shall hold your confidence sacred. While we both live, I shall never mention what you may choose to tell me. I said I would, but I had better tell you first what goes before the dream, that you may understand. I was a schoolmaster when I was a very young man. It was only a parish school in a little village in the West Country. No need to mention any names. Better not. I was engaged to be married to a young girl whom I loved and almost reverenced. It was the old story, while we were waiting for the time when we could afford to set up house together. Another man came along. He was nearly as young as I was, and handsome, and a gentleman with all a gentleman's attractive ways for a woman of our class. He would go fishing, and we would meet him while I was at my work in school. I reasoned with her and implored her to give him up. I offered to get married at once and go away and begin the world in a strange country, but she would not listen to anything I could say, and I could see that she was infatuated with him. Then I took it upon myself to meet the man and ask him to deal well with the girl, for I thought he might mean honestly by her, so that there might be no talk or chance of talk on the part of others. I went where I should meet him, with none by, and we met. Here Jacob Settle had to pause, for something seemed to rise in his throat, and he almost gasped for breath. Then he went on. Sir, as God is above us, there was no selfish thought in my heart that day. I loved my pretty Mabel too well to be content with a part of her love. 
And I had thought of my own unhappiness too often not to come to realist that whatever might come to her, my hope was gone. He was insolent to me. You, sir, who are a gentleman, cannot know, perhaps, how galling can be the insolence of one who is above you in station. But I bore with that. I plored him to deal well with the girl, for what might be only a pastime of an idle hour with him might be the breaking of her heart. For I never had a thought of her truth, or that the worst of harm could come to her. It was only the unhappiness to her heart that I feared. But when I asked him when he intended to marry her, his laughter galled me so that I lost my temper and told him that I would not stand by and see her life made unhappy. Then he grew angry, too, and in his anger said such cruel things of her that then and there I swore he should not live to do her harm. God knows how it came about, for in such moments of passion it is hard to remember the steps from a word to a blow. But I found myself standing over his dead body, with my hands crimson with the blood that welled from his torn throat. We were alone, and he was a stranger, with none of his kin to seek for him, and murder does not always out, not all at once. His bones may be withering, still, for all I know, in the pool of the river where I left him. No one suspected his absence or why it was, except my poor Mabel, and she dared not speak. But it was all in vain, for when I came back again after an absence of months, for I could not live in the place, I learned that her shame had come and that she had died in it. Hitherto I had been borne up by the thought that my ill deed had saved her future, but now, when I learned that I had been too late and that my poor love was smirched with that man's sin, I fled away with the sense of my useless guilt upon me more heavily than I could bear. No, oh, sir, you have not done such a sin. I don't know what it is to carry it with you. You may think that custom makes it easy to you, but it is not so. It grows and grows with every hour till it becomes intolerable, and with it growing, too, the feeling that you must forever stand outside heaven. You don't know what that means, and I pray God that you never may. Ordinary men to whom all things are possible don't often, if ever, think of heaven. It is a name and nothing more, and they are content to wait and let things be. But to those who are doomed to be shut out forever, you cannot think what it means. You cannot guess or measure the terrible, endless longing to see the gates opened and to be able to join the white figures within. And this brings me to my dream. It seemed that the portal was before me with great gates of massive steel, with bars of the thickness of a mast, rising to the very clouds and so close that between them was just a glimpse of a crystal grotto, on whose shining walls were figured many white-clad forms with faces radiant with joy. When I stood before the gate, my heart and my soul were so full of rapture and longing that I forgot. And there stood at the gate two mighty angels with sweeping wings, and, oh, so stem of continents. They held each in one hand a flaming sword, and in the other the latchet, which moved to and fro at their lightest touch. Nearer were figures all draped in black, with heads covered so that only the eyes were seen, and they handed to each who came white garments such as the angels wear. A low murmur came that told that all should put on their own robes, and without soil, or the angels would not pass them in, but would smite them down with the flaming swords. I was eager to don my own garment and hurriedly threw it over me and stepped 
swiftly to the gate, but it moved not, and the angels, loosening the hatchet, pointed to my dress. I looked down and was aghast, for the whole robe was smeared with blood. My hands were red. They glittered with the blood that dripped from them, as on that day by the river bank. And then the angels raised their flaming swords to smite me down, and the horror was complete. I awoke again and again. And again that awful dream comes to me. I never learned from the experience. I never remember. But at the beginning the hope, if ever, there to make the end more appalling. And I know that the dream does not come out of the common darkness where the dreams abide, but that it is sent from God as a punishment. Never, never shall I be able to pass the gate for the soil on the angel garments must ever come from these bloody hands. I listened as in a spell as Jacob Settle spoke. There was something so far away in the tone of his voice, something so dreamy and mystic in the eyes that looked as if through me at some spirit beyond, something so lofty in his very diction and in such marked contrast to his were and work clothes and his poor surroundings that I wondered if the whole thing were not a dream. We were both silent for a long time. I kept looking at the man before me in growing wonderment. Now that his confession had been made, his soul, which had been crushed to the very earth, seemed to leap back again to uprightness with some resilient force. I suppose I ought to have been horrified with his story, but strange to say I was not. It certainly is not pleasant to be made the recipient of the confidence of a murderer, but this poor fellow seemed to have had not only so much provocation, but so much self-denying purpose in his deed of blood, that I did not feel called upon to pass judgment upon him. My purpose was to comfort, so I spoke out with what calmness I could, for my heart was beating fast and heavily. You need not despair, Jacob Settle. God is very good, and his mercy is great. Live on and work on, in the hope that some day you may feel that you have atoned for the past. Here I paused, for I could see that sleep, natural sleep this time, was creeping upon him. Go to sleep, I said. I shall watch with you here, and we shall have no more evil dreams tonight. He made an effort to pull himself together and answered, I don't know how to thank you for your kindness to me this night, but I think you had best leave me now. I'll try and sleep this out. I feel a weight off my mind since I have told you all. If there's anything of the man left in me, I must try and fight out life alone. I'll go tonight as you wish it, I said, but take my advice and do not live in such a solitary way. Go among men and women, live among them, share their joys and sorrows, and it will help you forget. This solitude will make you melancholy mad. I will, he answered almost half-consciously for sleep was overmastering him. I turned to go, and he looked after me. When I had touched the latch, I dropped it, and coming back to the bed, held up my hand. He grasped it with both his as he rose to a sitting posture, and I said my good night, trying to cheer him. Heart, man, heart. This is where in the world for you to do, Jacob Settle. You can wear those white robes yet and pass through that gate of steel. Then I left him. A week after, I found his cottage deserted, and on asking at the works was told that he had gone north. No one exactly knew whither. Two years afterwards, I was staying for a few days with my friend Dr. Monroe in Glasgow. He was a busy man and could not spare much time for going about with me, 
So I spent my days in excursions to Trussocks and Loch Katrine, and down the Clyde. On the second last evening of my stay, I came back somewhat later than I had arranged, but found that my host was late too. The maid told me that he had been sent for to the hospital, a case of accident at the gasworks, and the dinner was postponed an hour, so telling her I would stroll down to find her master and walk back with him, I went out. At the hospital, I found him washing his hands preparatory for starting for home. Casually, I asked him what his case was. Oh, the usual thing, a rotten rope and men's lives of no account. Two men were working in a gas meter when the rope that held their scaffolding broke. It must have occurred just before the dinner hour, for no one noticed their absence till the men had returned. There was about seven feet of water in the gas meter, so they had a hard fight for it, poor fellows. However, one of them was alive, just alive. But we have had a hard job to pull him through. It seems he owes his life to his mate, for I have never heard of greater heroism. They swam together while their strength lasted, but at the end they were so done up that even the lights above and the men, slung with ropes, coming down to help them, could not keep them up. But one of them stood on the bottom and held up his comrade over his head, and those few breaths made all the difference between life and death. They were a shocking sight when they were taken out, for that water is like purple dye, with the gas and the tar. The man upstairs looked as if he had been washed in blood. Ugh. And the other? Oh, he's worse still. But he must have been a very noble fellow. That struggle under the water must have been fearful. One can see that by the way the blood had been drawn from the extremities. It makes the idea of the stigmata possible to look at him. A resolution like this could, you would think, do anything in the world. Aye, it might almost unbar the gates of heaven. Look here, old man, it is not a very pleasant sight, especially just before dinner. But you are a writer, and this is an odd case. Here is something you would not like to miss, for in all human probability, you will never see anything like it again. While he was speaking, he had brought me into the mortuary of the hospital. On the bier lay a body covered with a white sheet which was wrapped close around it. Looks like a chrysalis, don't it? I say, Jack, if there be anything in the old myth that a soul is typified by a butterfly, well, the one that this chrysalis sent forth was a very noble specimen and took all the sunlight on its wings. See here. He uncovered the face. Horrible, indeed, it looked, as though stained with blood. But I knew him at once. Jacob Settle. My friend pulled the winding sheet further down. The hands were crossed on the purple breast as they had been reverently placed by some tender-hearted person. As I saw them, my heart throbbed with a great exultation, for the memory of his harrowing dream rushed across my mind. There was no stain now on those poor, brave hands, for they were blanched white as snow. And somehow, as I looked, I felt that the evil dream was all over. That noble soul had won a way through the gate at last. The white robe had now no stain from the hands that had put it on.